My name is David Noreen. I'm interviewing today Robert Green on October 1st, 2007 in Studio X Campbell Hall, Urbana, Illinois. Henry M. Radcliffe will be assisting on lights, camera, and audio, and we'll be talking about uh, Mr. Green's service in the U.S. Navy. Okay, Mr. Green, welcome to Studio X. Uh, could you please tell us your story? Well, begin at the beginning. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles after moving from Boston at the age four. Uh, we arrived in Los Angeles in 1923 when uh, things were rather primitive out there, as you know. We lived on the west side of the city, not in uh, beautiful West Los Angeles, what they call West Los Angeles and Brentwood, but uh, in the Middle West. Uh, actually only a couple miles from the uh, Culver City boundary line where the studios of MGM and Hal Roach and the, uh, all those uh, movie people were. Uh, a very uh, middle-class neighborhood. I uh, attended uh, Hamilton High School in West Los Angeles and, and then on to uh, Los Angeles uh, Junior College and one year at UCLA, which was in 1939. My, uh, my junior year in college uh, was at UCLA. Um, at the end of that year, which was June of 1940, um, the um, government, uh, the Navy and the Army both started special midshipmen schools. Uh, we didn't quite know what that was all about. The war in Europe had already started, so we knew that there was going to be some kind of involvement. And uh, the Army and the Navy were very foresighted in signing up uh, young uh, college uh, men. We had to have at least two years of school uh, college at that time. Uh, and so I signed up for the Navy Reserve Midshipman School, not exactly knowing what was going to happen. And the recruiter, uh, this was June, and I needed my senior year to start in September. Oh, he said, that, that's okay, you'll be able to come back to school. Well, <laughs> as you know, things didn't work out that way. Um, I received a letter to report to the New York Midshipman School. Uh, well, actually, for uh, first we had to go to a 30-day uh, training uh, aboard a ship. And so that was in October of uh, 1940. And following the trip, uh, the uh, cruise, 30-day cruise <laughs> with no pay, um, we were assigned a midshipman school to attend uh, in the future. And so I was assigned to the New York Midshipman School uh, starting in March of 1941. Uh, that was a 90-day or 30, a three month or 90-day uh, school. And as I say, all the fellows were either college graduates already or had at least two years of schooling. And uh, so we went through uh, the 90 days and we were, we were called 90 Day Wonders because we got our ensign stripe after only nine, <laughs> three months of, of schooling. Of course, <clears throat> this, it, it's different from the uh, regular academies where, where the fellows are going to college anyway, and we, are, we were already had all our academic uh, work. We had, a, you know, we were history majors and mathematics majors and engineering majors, and so we were, it, it was, it was uh, like we'd already been to college, which we had. So after the uh, graduation ceremonies, we were either allowed to go home for a short time or assigned directly to ships. And uh, quite a few of my classmates were assigned to Pearl Harbor right away. 
or to the Navy training station at San Diego or San Francisco. Uh, I went home for a month or so and got orders ultimately to report to Seattle. Um, uh, no, I, at first I had to report to San Francisco for another uh, six weeks of schooling. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to San Francisco in maybe September of uh, 1941 and attended the uh, uh, six weeks of uh, additional schooling for uh, transport uh, ships, cargo ships and transport ships. Um, at that time, by fortunate, uh, just I happened to meet the young lady that became my wife a short time later. It was in uh, October of 1941, and I met her in a restaurant in San Francisco because of the UCLA Stanford football game. Mm. <laughs> she, she was a co-ed at UCLA and was up there with her girlfriend and waiting for a ride. Her cousin was going to take them down to the football game. And so I bummed a ride with mm. her and uh, 18 months later we were married. Mm -hmm. So you never know what's going to happen uh, uh, when you pick up a strange girl somewhere. Um, so you met her before the war, but then you got married during uh, the war. Yes, that's right. We met uh, before the war. And uh, uh, in uh, a couple days after I met her, which was uh, early in October, I was uh, assigned to this uh, ship in, in Seattle, which was being a recondition. It was a president liner from the Pacific Fleet and the Navy had bought up a half a dozen of these uh, uh, passenger ships and was converting them to troop transports. And so that's what was going on in Seattle and uh, four of my, uh, three, uh, three others of my classmates from San Francisco uh, and I were assigned to the uh, USS Zylan, which was then being refitted and uh, converted in, in uh, Seattle at the uh, shipyard right at the foot of the uh, city. So that was uh, October, November, December. We were um, just uh, lying there in, in Seattle uh, waiting for the ship to be finished. And finally, in January, it was ready to go, and we uh, took off and made our, uh, a lot of uh, Pacific uh, Coast cruise up and down the coast to uh, get the ship ready for, uh, uh, for the war. Do you remember what you were doing on December 7th, 1941? Uh... December 7th, 1941. Yes, I remember very well. I was, <laughs> I was still in bed in on Sunday morning and I was listening to the New York Symphony broadcast. They had every uh, Sunday uh, during the winters the New York Philharmonic broadcast on NBC the concert which uh, I suppose started at 2 o'clock in New York which was 11 o'clock uh, West Coast time and I was listening to the radio and listening the symphony when they broke into the uh, broadcast and said that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. So the other guys and I put on our uniforms very quickly and and went down to the ship, which was still a dead ship. It was it was uh, not ready to sail anywhere, but we uh, were required to report for duty, uh, such as it was, and we didn't have anything to do really. So that's, uh, that was December 7th, and of course, after that time, uh, Seattle was uh, in danger. They, they felt they were in danger all the time of uh, enemy attack, and so the city was blacked out, and uh, well, we just continued our normal life. And uh, finally, in January, as I say, we were ready to take our uh, ocean tests and, and get ready. Uh, we had to go down to San Diego to get our uh, Boats, you know, the this ship had uh, 32 
uh, personnel boats. They were called Higgins boats sometimes or, or other kind of uh, designation personnel. Uh, also four larger uh, boats which carried a large truck or a small tank and they were called a tank lighter. Uh, that, that's the one that had a great big ramp in front. Uh, the original uh, Higgins boat did not have any ramp. The, uh, the uh, soldiers or marines would come in over the side of the boat and leave on the side of the boat into the water or jump over the bow of the boat. So uh, anyway, we had to pick up our boats in San Diego and get the boat crews trained. Uh, so that, that went on for a couple of months uh, while the uh, damage at Pearl Harbor was being cleaned up. And ultimately, we uh, had an assignment and we took the first contingent of troops to the American Samoa. Uh, this was in, uh, I think it was in April of 1942. Uh, the um, attack on Tokyo had taken place only a couple of weeks earlier in March. Um, what was the name of that? Uh, you remember the uh, the air attack on Tokyo, 90 minutes over Tokyo, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we took this uh, contingent of troops to uh, fortify Samoa, and we were at the harbor at the Pango Pango for 30 days. Uh, they wouldn't let us come home because there were so many different things pending. At the same, just at about that time, the Battle of the Coral Sea was taking place, uh, where our forces of the uh, Yorktown and Lexington aircraft carriers had uh, defeated the Japanese and prevented them from landing uh, in Australia at uh, Port Moresby. So. Uh, we were there in the harbor at Pango Pango for 30 days uh, while the troops were all ashore. And so ultimately we came home back to uh, San Diego and the uh, Navy was preparing then for the invasion of Guadalcanal. We didn't know what that was all about, but we picked up our uh, contingent of Marines. We had, our ship could carry uh, approximately 1,600 uh, Marines or soldiers at one time. This was uh, the Zylon, the refitted ship. Pardon me? This is the Zylon, the refitted yeah, ship? Yeah, the Zylon, yeah, the Zylon. Uh -huh. um, and so we, we were assigned uh, to the operation uh, which included the attack on Guadalcanal, but two ships, mine and another ship, were assigned to a to the island of Tulagi, which is across the bay from the main landing place at Guadalcanal. So we took uh, 1,500 of the 2nd Marine Division to Guadalcanal, uh, to uh, uh, Tulagi, uh, which they captured in a few days. But meanwhile, we... Uh, uh, the night of our landings was a very terrible night. Uh, the uh, Japanese came, uh, the uh, warships came down from the north. They called that the slot, uh, the uh, body of water uh, between the islands, of, of, uh, the Solomon Islands formed a channel. And uh, they would come down from Rabaul, which was their main base. And uh, they attacked our uh, escorts and decimated our fleet there. They sank about uh, four or five cruisers and damaged four, uh, four others and uh, uh, sank four or five destroyers. Uh, that was a midnight battle which had us all up in arms. Uh, we were all on deck uh, waiting to be attacked. We didn't know what the heck to do. And what was uh, your... Had to, what was your role uh, on the ship? What, what kind of My duties? role on the ship at that time, I was, I was called a boat officer and division officer. Uh, the, uh, deck, the deck divisions were in charge of land, uh, putting the boats in the water and taking them back out. And then 
uh, I and uh, three or four other ensigns at that time were the boat officers. We would have the boat uh, take the boats into the beach uh, for unloading uh, or soldiers or un unloading cargo. Uh, so the, there would be five or six boats in each, each group and each uh, ensign would be a boat officer for the group. I see. Uh, so that's what we were doing, uh, except at night, uh, uh, a lot of the boats were loaded with uh, uh, ammo and food for the troops on the shore, but we had to jettison all that uh, luggage, uh, baggage, and bring the boats aboard because we had to get underway because we didn't know if the Japanese warships were coming for us. Uh, fortunately, before dawn, we found out that they broke off and went back home. And uh, but even so, the the Navy command didn't want the transports to stay there and be and risk being sunk. So we had to leave the soldiers and Marines on the shore, uh, more or less, uh, <laughs> without without additional weapon. Uh, ammo and and food, but they uh, that was only a few days time, and they got supplied again. Uh, so we went back to uh, to the New Hebrides Islands, uh, and we we had a lot of work to do between the New Hebrides and and uh, New Caledonia, where we went uh, a couple times. Uh, in between, we took a, a boatload of. Uh, uh, Japanese prisoners. They're, actually, they were Korean laborers who had been taken prison on, uh, prisoner on Guadalcanal. Uh, and so we took them down to New Zealand, <laughs> I guess for, <laughs> I hate to call it R&R, &R, but the, uh, they had these uh, Japanese prisoners at, uh, in New Zealand. I don't, never did know what they ever did with them down there. So we were in New Zealand for a few days and then came back and and uh, did some more work. Uh, it was, it was kind of like uh, Mr. Roberts, you know, uh, with going from apathy to uh, tedium or someplace. We were doing a lot of that kind of uh, cargo handling. Uh, so the, the Japanese had taken Korean prisoners and then forced them into slave labor. Yes, yeah, that, and that's about they the kind size. of abandoned those prisoners. Yeah. That, yeah, that's about the size of it. They, uh, the prisoners, uh, the, the Korean laborers, were the only ones who ever surrendered mm -hmm. uh, because they had no weapons. They couldn't fight. Uh, the, uh, as we know, the, the Japanese uh, soldiers and Marines never did surrender. They, they had to be uh, um, <laughs> fought to the death. <laughs> yeah. Um, Uh, we, in October, uh, we made another uh, foray into Guadalcanal with another boatload of troops, shipload of troops, excuse me, uh, for uh, supply and reinforcement. And that night, there was a terrible battle called the Battle of Santa Cruz, where the Japanese again came down uh, just after we had uh, departed the area and uh, there was uh, another terrible battle ensued where more of our ships were sunk, including, I, uh, uh, maybe the next night, okay, I'll, 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 de I'll defray that one. Uh, in November, on November 11th of 1942, we made our final uh, resupply troop, uh, trip to uh, Guadalcanal taking more soldiers and more uh, supplies. And that time, a enemy planes came over and dropped some bombs right next to our ship. I was in the water, I was in the boat at the time, uh, along with uh, maybe a hundred other sailors and, and officers. Uh, and we watched uh, from the boats, we could see the planes attacking our ship, and our captain uh, was able to evade most of the uh, damage. But a couple of bombs came right down and exploded outside of our hull. 
at the uh, stern of the ship and flooded the stern with water, uh, we were very close to being sunk at that time. But they got the ship underway, uh, uh, the damage was repaired, and we hauled the boats aboard and, and we uh, left the area, going back to safe harbor somewhere, and finally back to Pearl Harbor and back to San Diego. Did, did you that, have any an, anti-aircraft guns or not because it was a refitted cruise ship? Uh, were there uh, ships with you that were able to uh, fire we, at the planes? Uh, our, our own uh, repair crews fixed up our ship uh, uh, primarily in order to get us out of the area and back to New Hebrides where uh, further work could be done and finally back to Pearl Harbor and then back to San Diego. But were you able to defend yourself against the planes? No, uh, no. You didn't have... Uh, we, uh, our, our, uh, we had 50 caliber machine guns around the ship, but uh, they were uh, not of any use at that time because we, we, they were high, high, high altitude. level, high altitude bombers. Yeah, right. uh, they, they weren't dive bombing us, but they're just um, the ship was all, all but defenseless, uh, really. Um, that night, uh, November 11th, uh, there was another terrible battle called the Battle of Savo Island. And that, I believe that's the night that the five Sol Sullivan brothers' ship, the Juno, was lost or sunk. So, And it was after that point that the policy was changed that yeah. brothers wouldn't all serve on the same. Yeah, that's right. So my, my ship was uh, kind of lucky in a way, although we were damaged at that time, both in November and December, uh, I'm sorry, October and November, uh, we escaped uh, just before a fierce naval battle had broken out and uh, otherwise it, had we been in the harbors there uh, we probably would have been lost uh, in one of those battles. So the uh, damage to our ship was such that as I say we had to come back to uh, Long Beach and go in the dry dock for three months uh, at which time they they refurbished the ship completely and gave us uh, new uh, armament, a large scale uh, 20 millimeter uh, machine guns for the deck all around the ship. And at that time, <clears throat> I had this. Uh, I was still in touch with my dear girlfriend, the one I met in San Francisco, Betty. <laughs> And um, being uh, in Los Angeles uh, area for three months, um, we <laughs> decided to get married. Mm -hmm. uh, I, w I always told her she shouldn't marry a sailor from the Pacific that's going back to war. Mm -hmm. But uh, we did get married in 19, uh, February 13th of 1943. And... Uh, we're still together, 64 and a half years later, uh, here in uh, Champaign, Illinois. Um, let's see, what else do we want to know? Our ship was uh, finally repaired in, uh, around March of 43. And we were assigned a very pleasant interlude of duty to film the movie of Guadalcanal Diary. The, uh, Richard Tregascus, the author, had uh, written this book just after the battles of Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal was secured uh, for fighting purposes as of uh, January of uh, 43. And uh, he wrote this uh, book about the Marines. And so uh, we were, uh, the Navy crew the, I'm sorry, the movie crew would come down to San Diego uh, and uh, board our ship in the morning and we would go out in the after, uh, all day in the San Diego area uh, out of sight of, of land and other islands and uh, pretend that this, this was the invasion force uh, for uh, Guadalcanal. And we had all the movie actors aboard and the director 
and a couple of guys who were dressed in generals' uniforms who we, the sailors didn't know who was real and who was not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so our sailors uh, and my roommate, for example, were um, starring extras in, in this movie. Uh, and they were later able to see themselves on the screen when the movie came out? As many, many of them could, especially mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, my roommate, uh, Anson Kern, who was on the, on the top deck with his binoculars and his hat, with, you know, with a name across there, Kern, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lawyer from New Orleans. Um, so uh, William Bendix and Lloyd Nolan and, and uh, Richard Conti and uh, the other off, uh, movie stars were aboard our ship for five days. Mm -hmm. We would take them back to San Diego in the evening and then pick them up the next morning again. So that's what we did for five or six days. And finally, at the end of that period, we, the uh, studio had uh, constructed a uh, beach landing scene uh, at the marine base in uh, uh, Southern California there, uh, Camp Pendleton. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we loaded the uh, film, the movie people into our boats along with real Marines. And we ran them to the shore just like a real operation. Mm -hmm. And they all jumped out and went through the trees uh, to uh, back to Never Never Land. <laughs> so that was our time in Hollywood. Uh, after that, we got ready to recapture the Aleutian Islands. Uh, and in uh, May of uh, 1943, we boarded the uh, 7th Army Division uh, in San Francisco, and five or six transports uh, were involved with the battleship Pennsylvania and, and quite a few destroyer escorts, and we made the long trip over to Attu Island in the Aleutians. Uh, and by this time, uh, I, had <laughs> I had been promoted. Um, I was no longer a uh, boat officer, but I was assistant beach master. Now, for every landing operation, um, there has to be a beach party. It's not the kind of beach party with girls and beer. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a, a beach landing party where you uh, the beach, you control the boats from your ship that are coming into the beaches, and we would go in in the, usually in the, about the third wave. Uh, uh, the first wave of soldiers would, would uh, leave their boats and go ashore. Uh, so we were about the third wave and we would come in. Uh, there were probably about 30 to 40 men altogether. Uh, my, my boss, a, a, a lieutenant officer, was the beach master and I was assistant. And we had one doctor. Oh, the doctor, by the way, on the beach party was uh, my best man at my wedding, oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, he's, uh, he was a Chicago d uh, doctor uh, who was a heart uh, and internal specialist, and he retired to La Jolla, and we're in touch all the time still. He's, he's somewhat older than I am, but he's still with it, and uh, we get together whenever I go back to Southern California, and, and I talk to him on the phone every once in a while. He's a nice guy. So he was our best man, and he was our doctor on six or seven landings. He made more than I did. Um, so we had a doctor and uh, half a dozen uh, what they call pharmacist mates are the uh, you know the uh, arm the navy equivalent of of uh, medics. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had the medics ashore, and we'd have a couple of radio men, a couple of signalmen and eight or 10 regular sailors to do more heavy work. So whatever we had to do ashore to keep the boats coming and going, uh, that's what we did. And we lived ashore there for five days at, in the, on the sand at, 
uh, Atu, which was an absolutely terrible place. They <laughs> the Japanese had seized that, uh, and uh, people have wondered, was this a diversionary thing? or The Atu? To? Yes. Not, uh, for us? Well, uh, I think, aren't there different theories about why the Japanese had seized it? Oh, um, are they I trying to divert us from the South Pacific or possibilities of attacking Alaska or well, it, having a, a base there? It was a, um, they, I guess they took uh, Atu and Kiska at that uh, early, early on in order to have a, a guard duty on the northern perimeter and, and it would have been helpful if they had uh, uh, been able to capture Midway. But I, I don't know any other uh, devious reason for that. But we felt we had to take it back because we couldn't have the, um, we couldn't have them on our territory, uh, so to speak, and making flights uh, over Midway or over the uh, Western Pacific. So they were using it as an air base. Thing. Yeah, it was an air. Uh, yeah, they had an air base there. Um, so anyway, that uh, uh, after uh, the army took about thirty or forty days to secure the island, uh, I don't know how many troops, uh, how many uh, Japanese there were there, but it was that was a very bad place. <clears throat> Continuous fog, rain, even though it was uh, May of. Uh, uh, the springtime, it was it's always terrible up there. And so we came back and um, fooled around San Diego again a little while. And then the Army decided to mount another invasion, and that would be Kiska. Kiska lies a couple hundred miles east of Atu. Uh, so we mounted another invasion, and again, I was a assistant beachmaster. And maybe you heard about Kiska. When we got there, we uh, a day or two later, we learned that there were no troops. There were no Japanese there. They had left under the cover of fog a week or more earlier. And ultimately, the story came out many years later that our high command actually had known that there were no Japanese in Kiska, on Kiska, um, which was a nasty thing. It was, it was really terrible. We had about 30,000 men that we landed there. We had 10 transports, I think, all kinds of destroyers and a battleship, Canadian troops, and everybody, you know, it, 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 was, it was a terrible thing because a landing operation is never a, uh, an easy thing. There's, there's, there's always a possibility of fight fatalities just from always. having to coordinate everything. That's right, exactly. And, uh, and especially in that kind of weather. It was, it was so bad, you know, fog and rain all the time. Um, and... And Why do you think that uh, that they went ahead with that? Do you think it was a matter of not wanting the Japanese to know that we had broken no. the code, or no? Uh, it, it, in in one of my uh, uh, stories, the uh, they asked the, the commander. Well, he said, "It'll maybe there's no Japs there, but it'll be a good operation. It, it's, it's good practice." practice. Well, you know, with 30,000 men, you just don't casually have a good practice landing. Uh, it, it's pretty high. And uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, 20 men, 20 soldiers did die. They, were, they came across each other in the fog, and they didn't know that there was no Japanese. Somebody opened fire, and there was a whole fusillade of fire, and 20 people died. And so there you know that that's pretty pretty awful for a for a non-existing enemy uh for and what amounts to a practice landing uh is it, just unconscionable. Mm -hmm. So that that's the way that was. 
Um, <clears throat> following Kiska. Ooh, what happened? That was uh, that was August of 1943, and. Um, We came back to San Diego again. Now, were there other Aleutian Islands as well, or was just those two that were? Those, those were the only two that the Japanese had occupied. Okay. Uh, yeah, the uh, islands themselves stretch all the way from the Alaskan mainland to the, uh, uh, two thousand miles. Mm -hmm. uh, Cold Bay and Kiss and Dutch Harbor and all those places. All, all lovely scenic spots to go to. <laughs> uh, was, it, was it ever determined where they had gone to? Uh, was there a ship that uh, that they had been able to, you know, get to and return to Japan? Or uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Well, you mentioned that you know when you got to the island, there were no Japanese there. That they had gotten away in the fog. Oh yeah. But had they just gone back to Japan? Or oh to yeah. Another... Oh, mo most likely, yeah. They, okay. uh, they had submarines and transports that just took them back to okay, Japan. I'm sure. Then. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so after we got back home again, uh, then we had another operation, and that was our um, my last one on this island. Um, we uh, we went to uh, we went to New Zealand, where the Second Marine Division had been having R and R after the uh, Guadalcanal campaign and other uh, operations that they had been in, and we picked. Uh, we picked up uh, 1,500 uh, Marines. Uh, we were along with maybe 10 other transports and several cargo ships. And we made the invasion uh, and the recapture of Tarawa uh, in the Central Pacific. Uh, and again, I was assistant beachmaster at Tarawa with the same crew, uh, the same 30 or 40 guys, and the same doctor, Dr. Hasterlick, uh, and his corpsmen. And as you know, uh, or you may know, uh, Tarawa was a, a pretty dreadful operation for the Marines and, and not so great for the Navy either. Uh, that operation essentially lasted four days, and 1,100 Marines died mostly in the first day, or a second, uh, half of the second day. Um, 2,400 more were wounded, and some very severely. Um, the the uh, landing was was pretty terrible because there was no place to land. We, we could, the uh, island uh, is surrounded by a, a coral reef and we, our boats couldn't get ashore over the reef. And the Marines had to de debark and walk through the water, shoulder high water sometimes, all the way to the beach and they, were, they died. They were under fire the whole time, right? Hmm? They were under fire from and the And they beach. were under fire from the shore, oh yes, under fire all the time. And the boats uh, were being blown out of the water too. Uh, they had, they brought in these things called Amtraks, amphibious tractors, which would, mm -hmm. could float and run at the same time, you know. And they were supposed to be able to crawl over the reef, which they could do for the most part, but they were so slow that he, after they got into the lagoon, the Japanese gunners ashore could see them and, and blew them out of the water. So we lost almost all those. I don't think any Amtrak ever got back to its base, uh, to its uh, 
uh, base ship. Hmm. Uh, so the Marines uh, struggled ashore, and meanwhile, my we had two uh, boats for the beach party, and we never could land the, the first day at all. Uh, and we were in our boat all night long, just going back and forth, uh, because you couldn't stand still, uh, otherwise they might gun you. Um, so in the morning, uh, uh, this Tarawa had one feature from the, from the uh, island. There was a long pier, which was a supply pier and, and uh, seaplane ramp. Uh, so this long pier went from the from the land out to the edge of the reef, and that's how they got their uh, supplies in. Uh, and so my beach party uh, was instructed to land uh, at eight o'clock the next morning on the end of the pier, <clears throat> and we set up uh, there to uh, bring in boats. Uh, the pier was wide enough so that two boats could come in at the same time. And uh, they brought troops and uh, ammunition and uh, armament. Uh, some of the, we could get field pieces in there, and a tank, uh, and then more tanks and and more uh, mortars and so forth. So uh, ultimately, all morning long, we we're bringing uh, new stuff in. And uh, uh, meanwhile, the. Uh, <laughs> The Japanese defenders were all around the perimeter of the island, uh, facing us. Uh, and my my captain, <laughs> my lieutenant uh, boss, had the bright idea of building a wall, and so we built a wall of uh, supply boxes, like ammo boxes and food boxes. We built a wall along uh, the pier for about 30 yards. Uh, this pier was like, it must have been about uh, 200 yards long, mm -hmm. maybe 300 yards maybe, like a football field. <laughs> Two or three football uh, fields. Yeah. And so we built a, a, a protective wall at the end of the pier to keep us from being hit by sniper fire. And so we, we worked uh, all hunt, hunkered down. Uh, the Marine... Um, corpsmen would uh, would bring their uh, wounded boys out to the pier, and we would um, our doctors and corpsmen would uh, uh, you know um, <laughs> fix them up for uh, do what they could, and we put them in the boats and take them back to the ship for uh, uh, hospitalization. Mm -hmm. uh, my ship. Uh, the Zylan was also a Class B hospital ship, and we had a, a sick bay that could accommodate about 25 or 30 people. But uh, when we kept bringing the uh, wounded guys back, you know, and they would lift them up on the stretchers from the ship. Um, by the time we got through with the operation, we had about 300 wounded people aboard. And the other transports uh, and cargo ships the same. They, we had a lot of guys. Uh, there were, as I say, there were at least uh, 1,200 wounded uh, Marines during the three or four days. Uh, so it, uh, that's, that's what went on there for uh, we were we were on the end of the pier for uh, I got three and a half days uh, mostly before we got uh, clearance to come back and after that um, we uh, we took all these people back three about 300 wounded people back to Pearl Harbor and I had, uh, at that moment when we got to Pearl Harbor, there were orders awaiting for me to report back to the U.S. and get to get another ship. Uh, as you may know, the by this time I was a lieutenant, and I was a full, what they call, 
senior watch officer. So I, I could, I was the senior deck officer underway uh, on our various watches. And we, we all had to learn very quickly, as you can imagine. Uh, it was uh, very intensive on the job training. Uh, and the, uh, I have to digress a minute, the, the transport ships were originally uh, manned uh, in the officer category with merchant marine officers. They were a part of the Navy. They were Navy Reserve. And uh, the masters uh, would, be, would become lieutenant commanders and the uh, uh, First mate and second mate, they might be a lieutenant or a lieutenant JG when the war started. Um, and so these, these guys were our, our teachers aboard ship. And what does so the JG uh, stand for? Lieutenant hmm? JG, what does the JG stand oh, for? Oh, the uh, junior grade lieutenant. Okay. A lieutenant junior grade. You have ensign, then lieutenant junior grade, lieutenant, uh, lieutenant commander, and commander and captain. Uh, so the uh, merchant marine officers were wonderful, wonderful sailors and uh, very, uh, uh, very good to us uh, new 90-day wonder guys who, who really didn't know what the heck we were doing. Uh, but they taught us and, and we if you kept your mouth shut and followed orders, you, you got along pretty well. Uh, so uh, that, that's what we had to do. Anyway, by, by two years, I was a senior deck officer running a ship with 600 men. <laughs> and, and when you had your watch detail, uh, yes. what were you doing? You had binoculars and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, watching on the, for on the approach this, of planes? On, and, the, on the main deck, uh, on the, uh, in the main... Uh, 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 <laughs> the chart house, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the, where where the uh, uh, helmsman was, and so we would have our orders of the day, and uh, know where we were going and what what courses we were steering. The captain was always right behind us. His his quarters were just one doorway uh, off the bridge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, the executive officer was nearby, the navigator was nearby, so uh, the officer of the deck wasn't alone by any chance, but uh, we, we had to do our work. And then when we were not on, on, uh, on the bridge, we had to do our regular divisional work. I, I had a division of 100 men uh, that took care of all the decks, you know, and the boats and the stuff like that. So we, it was... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, working and learning to do. Um, so anyway, after uh, we got back to Pearl Harbor on December 7th of 1943, and I had orders to report home and get a new ship. And the new ship was in New York. So I had a 30-day leave, and I got... Uh, Got it reacquainted with my wife, who was <laughs> of nine months. <laughs> um, we were able to go to the uh, UCLA Rose Bowl game on uh, January 1st, 1944. And then I had to depart for New York after. And in New York, there was another transport similar to the one I had before. This was called the Arlington and uh, I was going to be the damage control officer for that ship as a first assistant to the person who is called the first lieutenant. Uh, in the Navy the, a, a, guy, a title of first lieutenant means uh, he, he's about the third ranking deck officer following the captain and the executive officer and the first lieutenant is in charge of all the 
the uh, hull of the ship and the boats and all the rigging and anchors and everything. <clears throat> well, the Arlington was not, uh, it was still being converted from some kind of a cargo ship and it wasn't ready for another two or three months and I think it was in May we finally got the sea duty, uh, sea tests and so forth. And uh, by June we were ready to go, we were sailing up and down the Atlantic and we got orders to go to Seattle, <laughs> uh, of all things. And I thought sure we were going to Europe because after all the, uh, in middle, mid-1944 Everything was going to Europe, but that didn't happen. We we were sent back to Seattle to become an APA uh, boat landing training ship. And APA stands for APA. Yes, uh, that's uh, attack transport. Uh, uh, the P is for personnel, okay. and the A is for attack which means the boat to go ashore, you know. <clears throat> um, we were, my wife uh, had uh, been with me in New York for several months. And when we uh, finally took off, she came home to uh, Los Angeles. And when we found we were going to Seattle, she got on the train and joined me in Seattle when we got there. But that uh, that little bit of heaven lasted only about two weeks, and I had new orders to uh, report back to San Francisco on an emergency basis to take the place of a lieutenant who had broken his leg <laughs> falling down the stairs at the officers club. <laughs> and my new duty was to become first lieutenant of this giant erector set called a floating dry dock. And I had never heard of a floating dry dock up to that moment. What the Navy had done it was a really an incredible forward-looking feat of, of engineering. They, they built these sections of dry docks. They were all self-contained. A section was 200 feet long and 100 feet wide and they would be towed across the ocean by tow, uh, tugboats and other ships and assembled on the site. And they were assembled, uh, welded together to form a basin for a dry dock. And so... Where ships the, could be repaired that had been uh, uh, that's uh, right. damaged in battle. <clears throat> so... That's what happened we, uh, two days after I got to San Francisco on a, as, as the first lieutenant, which is an important officer, <laughs> aboard a vessel that I had no idea what the heck it was or how it worked. Uh, so there I was, and we, our, 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 sec our seven sections were towed across the Pacific for 46 days. It took to get to this place called the Admiralty Islands, which is in the Bismarck Archipelago on the equator, more or less, just, just north of New Guinea. And uh, we got there in, uh, at the end of October of 1943, or uh, 44, I guess it was, 44. There was already a dock in business there. Uh, a, a 10 section dock was already operating. And so it took us uh, until December 7th to um, get the dock assembled. 
the assembly was uh, supervised by the Navy officers called civil engineer, the CEC Corps. Uh, the civil engineers uh, were the shipbuilders and dry dock people. Uh, when we started docking ships, we, there was a contingent of sea bees that lived ashore and the sea bees would come and do all the uh, manual labor, all of the ship fitting, the plumbing, uh, and uh, boilerplate, and uh, whatever was necessary to repair the ships. And then they would go back. Uh, they were working six-hour shifts, so they uh, around the clock. So uh, we had a, every six or seven hours, there'd be a new shift of guys come aboard and repair the whatever was going on. Um, the, I was the only, except for the captain um, on this ship, uh, on my dry dock, he, he was a uh, regular Navy guy, uh, commander at that time. But none of the other officers had been to sea. <laughs> Uh, they had been with the dry dock for a year or two, uh, and, and the civil engineer officers uh, were not uh, seagoing people, mostly. So the captain appointed me to be the pilot to bring vessels into the dry dock as needed. So that's what I did. I was the only one that had any ship uh, handling experience. and. Uh, so on December 7th of, <laughs> December 7th keeps turning up, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, 1944, we docked our first ship, the uh, cruiser, heavy cruiser St. Louis. And I went out with, in a boat and I got, came aboard the St. Louis. It, fortunately, the St. Louis wasn't damaged by the war. She, she only needed minor repairs. And uh, I went aboard the ship and uh, took over. The captain gave me the bridge. <laughs> and uh, I had a couple of boats that uh, and we progressed our way into the dry dock and came to a stop. And that was our first time and we did it very well. And so the captain gave, gave us a well done. Uh, that's important. So anyway, in the next, uh, from December to the end of the war, we were docking ships every few days. Sometimes they'd be in for three or four days. Sometimes it'd be one day. And altogether, we took care of about a hundred ships in the six or seven month period before the war came to an end. And that was very important. Uh, there were there were two docks at Guam, and uh, we had two there at uh, Manus Island. So we must have, between the four docks, I mean, oh, you may recall that, that during this time was the invasions of, of Okinawa and uh, Iwo Jima and all of the kamikazes and so forth. So the da uh, and the Philippines, uh, uh, the Philippines operation was going on a lot of damage. So these ships were very, the dry docks were very, very important in the scheme of things to uh, uh, help get ships back in, in uh, into action rather than coming all the way back to Pearl Harbor or or not getting repaired at all. So this this was a very important thing. Sounds like your crew must have been very efficient uh, with all these shifts of getting the ships fixed up really quickly if you were able to return so many of them. Oh yeah, uh, it, we, we did. We had a, a very um, a wonderful crew and, they, uh, and the engineering officers were good. Um, if we had a large ship to dock, for example, the uh, engineering officer would go, uh, we would get the ship's uh, uh, hull plan, and we had to set the, the uh, they had to set keel blocks at the, at the uh, 
on the floor of the dry dock and the keel blocks were held in place by wires and so each ship had a different configuration for its keel and so uh, when we uh, we would bring the ship in and then the engineers would lift the uh, uh, lift the dry dock up by pumping water out and it would come up under the hull of the ship under the keel and then our divers we had divers would go down and inspect the connection between the keel and the and the keel blocks and make sure everything was tight and and uh, in place and then the engineers would bring the ship up out of the water uh, in the, into the dry air. Uh, it was a, a wonderful, marvelous operation. It's just, just incredible. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, okay. If we could just pause for a minute, we're going to put another tape in. Sure. They run out after a while. Okay, I'm David Noreen. Once again, this is tape two of our interview with Robert Green. We were talking about the uh, dry dock operations that he worked on. <coughs> Would you like to continue? Alrighty. Um, well, one interesting uh, uh, in, um, incident at the dry dock, we were several hundred miles away from any Japanese um, installation uh, the nearest one was this place I mentioned before at the uh, top of the Solomon Islands. Now I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> anyway, um, as I say, we were about 200 miles away from, uh, from that. And one night at midnight, I, uh, uh, by the way, at the, on the dry dock, the, um, it, it was too hot to sleep inside the uh, walls of the dock, which had been made for cruise quarters. Uh, we, the carpenters made uh, uh, kind of a lattice work uh, uh, living quarters on top of the uh, wing wall. Um, that's where uh, we had uh, all, the, all the people lived on top of the dock. So I, I was at the end. My quarters were at the end of the dock. And I heard this terrible airplane noise at midnight. And I thought one of the marine pilots is going to crash our, our dock. We had a marine airstrip not far away. And it turned out there was a terrible explosion right under my bunk, practically. Uh, a, Japanese torpedo plane had let loot, had come over from Rabaul, that's the place. Uh, two planes came over and they dropped two torpedoes. One hit our dock and the other hit the other dock. Uh, it was on the end of the dock and the timbers flew up in the air 50 feet high. Uh, but <laughs> the, the dock was... <laughs> Very, very secure and, and nothing really happened. We shook a little bit and uh, everybody realized what happened and the, the two planes, uh, we think, were splashed into the bay uh, not far away from the docks. So uh, <laughs> it seems kind of weird to, ha to have a dry dock that's been torpedoed, but that's, that's what happened to us. Uh, these, uh, I told you this was like a, a giant erector set. And so the engineers and crewmen detached the section that was damaged to just cut the bolts apart for the welding and pulled it out. And then we sank down and they docked our own section, uh, put it back in on skids and repaired it and then reversed the procedure and, and uh, because the dock was, was uh, still uh, viable and operating, even with six sections, it was perfectly okay. So uh, that was an interesting sideline. 
uh, I wanted to go back a minute to our action at Tarawa, which of course was terribly bloody and um, my crewmen uh, were, there were many uh, of my friends, uh, the officers who were the boat people bringing the troops back and forth. But there were a dozen different heroic rescues. Uh, one of our sailors, uh, uh, the boat mechanic, ha ha swam out a hundred yards to get a help to come back to his boat to rescue the guys that were trapped. Uh, and other, uh, uh, one, of, uh, one guy from another ship was uh, the actor. Um, Eddie Albert, who was a Lieutenant J.G. at that time, and he was a, what they call a salvage boat officer, and he rescued a boatload of 30 Marines uh, that were in danger of being uh, uh, annihilated. Uh, so altogether, we had these wonderful uh, people working under fire and uh, they were, after the battle, the captain, uh, our, our captain was allowed to appoint um, people that win, to win uh, citations and awards. And one of our officers was awarded the Navy Cross, which is fantastically high, uh, next, next to the Medal of Honor. And six months later, <laughs> when I was aboard the Arlington, I got this package from the Navy <laughs> that had awarded me the Silver Star for my duties aboard the at the end of the dock with all the other guys. Uh, my senior officer, Lieutenant Taylor, had been similarly um, honored and Several of our other guys, uh, the, the boat mechanic that rescued the 30 guys were, was given a silver star. And uh, I said, well, I really didn't, you know, I, it, it was hard work for four days, but all the other guys were doing the same thing. Uh, but, you know, the, the captain gets a single out who gets awards. And I'm, I'm very gratified. It, uh, it, it was a nice thing to do. The uh, the Marines themselves had hundreds of awards. They, they, those boys were just incredible. It, it, the way that uh, aboard my ship, the uh, Zylan, uh, we had uh, carried the uh, top command of the Second Marine Division, uh, Colonel Shoup, who was given a Medal of Honor, and Lieutenant Hawkins, who was also a Medal of Honor. Uh, so uh, uh, Colonel Shoup survived and Lieutenant Hawkins didn't. Uh, he he was a, a terribly brave young man uh, who was killed on the second day of operations. So anyway. He was killed while he was uh, taking the troops into the... Uh, Lieutenant Hawkins? Yes. Uh, he, he had got ashore with his uh, small con a boatload of boys and was attacking uh, the pillboxes and was uh, injured. He was injured three, di he was hit three different times. Uh, and finally, uh, the do uh, his shoulder was totally blown away and they couldn't save him because he lost too much blood. Um, so that was, that was a pretty bad thing. So anyway. Uh, I was aboard the uh, dry dock until the end of the war. Uh, oh, uh, in, in January of 1945, while the operations in the Philippines were still progressing, my former ship, the Xylan, was involved in the landings at Lingayen Gulf. Uh, 
that that ship had a had a wonderful, marvelous history. It, they must have been involved in 15 different landings. They were all over the place: Guam, uh, the Australian coast, uh, and finally uh, the Philippines. And they were struck by a kamikaze plane while doing their work at uh, Lingayen Gulf. And this one day in January, we got notice that the Xylan was coming to our dry dock to have uh, some uh, repairs made. Actually, we didn't dock them. They came alongside, and our traveling cranes took off all the damaged superstructure. The, the kamikaze had, had smashed into the top of the Xylan superstructure and uh, wiped away a, a gun position and killed six people and injured about 20 more. Um, but there was no damage that would sink the ship. So anyway, they were able to come down and they pulled alongside my dry dock and uh, our cranes were able to uh, take away all the damaged goods. And so I got to go aboard and see my, <laughs> my old buddies once again. Uh, most of them were still uh, the same as I had left them a year ago, a year before. Were they surprised to see you there? <laughs> <laughs> Rather, yeah, they were. Yeah, uh, they were pretty surprised. <laughs> uh, it's funny, that, you know, the the the, <laughs> the vagaries of life. Uh, you never know where that where it's going to lead you. Uh, so. That was uh, the war ended in in August, as we as we know, and uh, I got to come home. I stayed aboard for another month or so, waiting for uh, transportation, and so I didn't get home till about November of uh, 1945, and uh, that was that was the end of our. Or uh, experience. Uh, that, that's about the size of it. Uh, I didn't stay in uh, as a reservist. Mm -hmm. So you also earned four battle stars on your first ship, right? Yes. Uh, My four battle stars were for uh, the Guadalcanal operation the Tarawa, and the two Aleutian Island campaigns. Mm -hmm. Atu and Kiska. Yes. <clears throat> my, uh, my ship, uh, the fellows that were aboard, uh, some, some of the crew, uh, the Navy had a habit of, uh, officers were rotated every year or two for, uh, for whatever reasons. But uh, my crewmen on the uh, Zylan, some of them were aboard for the whole four years of the war. Mm -hmm. Came aboard in January in Seattle and, and took the ship all the way through decommissioning, uh, including a, a, a part of the flying, what they call the flying carpet, of bringing the boys home from Japan, uh, from the Orient. Uh, so that was... Uh, uh, we, the Zylan Association is still in operation. They, they're just having a another uh, reunion in um, Phoenix. I couldn't go because of other uh, uh, commitments, but uh, we, they still have 15 or 16 sailors that will come to the reunions, mm -hmm. uh, along with uh, 30 or 35 family members. Uh, Many of the fellows bring their grandchildren. Uh, I was with them in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago. Uh, so we had, we had a very, very nice reunion. Probably won't have very many more because everybody is over 80 years old now. <laughs> and uh, we're running out of, uh, running out of time. You okay. mentioned there is a book on that, too, uh, by Robert E. Whit Witter, uh, Attack Transport. Yes. Robert Witter, uh, I, he, he's a uh, writer down south somewhere, 
and somehow he picked up the story of the Zyland. We, we were very popular because uh, we, we got a lot of notice. Uh, in our Guadalcanal operation, we had ro uh, Robert, a um, famous writer, uh, oh dear, my mind. Um, he, he, uh, for Time Magazine, he was aboard our ship twice. And so with having him uh, uh, aboard the ship, we got extra coverage in Time Magazine and others. And so this fellow Witter uh, picked up this, uh, all these stories and uh, finally decided to write a book. He contacted our association and uh, eight or ten of us who were uh, um, willing to participate in the study uh, uh, gave him uh, stories and, and depositions about what was going on. Uh, Robert Sherrard uh, was mm -hmm. the uh, writer, uh, the uh, journalist that was with us. Uh, so, uh, and 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 that had that was twice: once at Tulagi and once at uh, Tarawa. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of coverage from him. You you mentioned another book too uh, by Colonel Joseph Alexander uh, on Tarawa. Yes, Colonel Alexander wrote the definitive minute-by-minute uh, -minute story of the Battle of Tarawa. Uh, Colonel Alexander is still, uh, he's a uh, well-known writer and he attends many, many sessions of the Pacific uh, War that goes on down at the Nimitz Museum in Texas. Uh, so, uh, yes, Colonel Alexander wrote the book. I, I gave him a few uh, incidents of our of my involvement, uh, so that was uh, that. His book is called "Utmost Savagery." Utmost Savagery, yes, and it's he goes minute by minute through the the whole thing with all different threads of of Elam. Nobody knows the story, you know. No, no one person can ever know what's going on, sometimes 20 feet away. So there's all kinds of different little threads of the stories that have to be told. And he picked them all up and merged them into one book, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, no, as I say, we... Uh, after the war, I, uh, I had one more year of college to do, and uh, we lived on the northwest side of, nor northeast side of Los Angeles, and uh, right, right next to, was just one block away from Occidental College. So I walked to school every day. I, I finished my uh, bachelor's degree at Occidental College in, in Los Angeles. And, uh, I went into the uh, insurance business and became a uh, pension plan consultant and administrator. And that's what I did for for about 40 years. <laughs> Finally retired and came here to live. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank very you. Interesting story. Thank you very much. My pleasure.